welcome to Aesthetics Mastery, the podcast that helps you raise the bar and thrive in medical aesthetics. And today we have a very exciting session where we are out on the road for the very first time. We are with Maria Farquharson of Behold Me Aesthetics in Garforth, Leeds. And we thought we'd take the show on the road to explore Maria's journey, basically. We want to know more about her time going from intensive care nurse to thriving aesthetics career. So I want to take you in and dive into her brain in your career. Well, thanks for asking. <laughs> I'm really excited that you're here and yeah, thank you. It's a pleasure. So tell me, what first made you think about aesthetics? Where, where were you at in your life? What did you, what were you doing before aesthetics? I can tell you exactly when the conversation took place and we we're in Greece okay. and me and Liam were having one of those like life talks where you're like, oh, what do you want to do when we retire? <laughs> like 50 years. And he's like, oh, why don't we get like a villa in Greece? And I was like, well, what can we do to be here? Mm. So th- we started talking about jobs, like the job that I was in, the job he was in. And one of the things that came up in conversation was my friend's mum had a clinic in Garforth as a nurse doing aesthetics. So he said, how did... How did she get into that? What did she do? And I was like, I don't know. And then it started from there, really. Wow, wow. When was that? Which year was that? That was 2015. Okay, okay. So I was working in York then, in intensive care. And then I moved shortly after that to Leeds. Okay. And what did you... uh, When did you get into nursing? When? Yeah. Um, It was 2011. Okay. So you'd been in nursing for four years at that point. No, so I'd finished my training, sorry, I was at uni from October 2011. Okay. And then completed in 2014. Okay, okay. So you had a year in intensive care. Yeah. And is that where, when you were in intensive care, did you, is that where you decided you wanted your career to go at that point? Did you want to be there or did you kind of stumble into it? Uh, no, like my last placement was intensive care and it's something that always scared me, like throughout my nurse training and I, I tend to this is just a thing I do, go towards things that scare me. Okay. I like to understand them. So I, I decided that I would try and then work in intensive care. So I got my first job there through just wanting to understand it a bit more, mm-hmm. what it was about. Why are you drawn to things that you don't understand or that might be scary? I don't really know where it comes from, to be honest. I don't know if it is just that pushing myself or challenging myself or... I don't know. But it's just something that I've always been like. Things that... I don't know. I can't explain it. Do you feel a pull? Do you want to go towards Yeah, I think it's knowledge. I think I like to know things. Mm. And I think if I don't know, then I should know. Right. So I'll put myself in situations where I'll find out. Okay. Why should you know? What what do you stand to gain from being knowledgeable? It's just... I just like to study, I suppose. Is it because you are creative and you kind of want to expand your brain to know more about the world around you? I think so. Like, I'm really inquisitive. Like, I'm the kind of person that it doesn't matter what job I'm in, like, there's always something more that I need to know and there's more I can do or, yeah. It's been a theme, really. But you do acknowledge that it scares you as well. It does scare me, yeah. Yeah, like... (laughs) The idea of working there when I was a student was terrifying and then to get the job I was excited and scared at the same time but then the more I did it the more I started being comfortable with certain situations I wouldn't have been before yeah so it's like the knowledge will allow you to be comfortable Mm -hmm. and when you first started thinking about aesthetics was that the pull of the house in Greece Mm. Or was there some push going on there as well, away from intensive care? Oh no, the push. The push was much stronger than the pull. The pull was the, com- do you know, like, the Greece conversation started a conversation, but actually the, the real push was just being utterly miserable in my job. And I was doing shift work, Liam works in Glasgow, he works in Scotland, he has done for the last four years, we didn't see each other, and um, we are planning our wedding, like... We just didn't have a life together, really. And then it felt like the days off were just compensating for the misery. So I just like spent my whole wage like shopping and doing all this on things to try and make myself happy. Mm. 
And when you were in intensive care, like tell me more about that. What did it, what what did it feel like? What were you trying to get away from? Like why? I think it it's a technical job, and I really enjoyed that side of it. But it's incredibly sad, and I think I am quite a. I do feed off other people's feelings. So I think the more I was around sad situations, I just felt sad in myself. Mm -hmm. But then I was saying to you earlier, it's just that people were sat there with their loved ones saying things like, oh, they were they had planned this trip, they'd wanted to do this, and you know they've never got the opportunity, they've been robbed of time, and, and they were young or whatever it was. And I've just always had all these desires, like musically, like, I like to write songs, I've written songs forever, like I've written poetry, like from being little, drawn my whole life and I didn't do any of that when I was working there, nothing. So the first thing that I started doing was open mic nights, Okay. but when I were in intensive care, to try and fill that void of like the creation that I was missing, but again, I was like absolutely terrified of like performing in front of people. I mean, like the first time I did it, um, I didn't plug my guitar in properly. There was no sound coming out of it. It was like really embarrassing. And, and then I was like, right, I'm not doing that again. Cause it was horrible. And then my husband was like, but you're really good. Like you need to keep doing it. So I did a bit more and then I invited my friends, which I didn't do before, I was just going on my own. Um, and then yeah, started, I did a few gigs in a pub in York. Mm. And then I just stopped. And when you were in intensive care. Yeah. And it that was me just letting fear get on top of me. And Tell me more about that. Um well it was just when I was performing, like I was so scared of messing it up that I'd rather not do it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't. I just stopped. Mm -hmm. So like I bought myself a little loop pedal and I was like making songs like live and obviously the nature of that is that you can do it wrong mm. um, and a few times I did and it just really put me off mm -hmm. I couldn't collect myself to get through it so I just stopped I just stopped again and you'd when you're in intensive care as well you'd stop the other creative elements oh yeah I wasn't drawing I wasn't painting I wasn't doing any of my writing like nothing music I'd always been like listening to music on in the car or I didn't I didn't read I just literally like my whole life was just can I know more about tracheostomies I'm not even joking like I'll get home and be like oh I've not seen that before I'll read about that but is that but is that a bad thing I mean you that was maybe part of the creative act so I think some of it is like I, and I do enjoy studying but I think I, what I was doing is I was just uh, prolonging my work right. you know like I wasn't doing anything for myself when I got home I was just extending stuff that I needed to know from work so it didn't so it wasn't it wasn't, wasn't from a place of creation, it was from a place of fear that you had to well, yeah, get it right. Like yeah, exactly that. Like I was so terrified that like someone would get hurt or like yeah. I didn't know about something that they might need that I'd just sit up and read about stuff. Yeah. To do with work. Yeah. So tell me about the time when you were discussing this with Liam, you had that beautiful vision of the villa in Greece. Yeah. You were having the push of things being so intense and not feeling like I think what I'm hearing is you're saying it didn't feel like you because you you weren't able to be creative and it felt did it feel a bit stifling would you say it's self-expression I've thought a lot about this and, and and I didn't know how to express myself and that made me miserable and was that just not being able to express yourself at night or was it as in you couldn't be creative or was it also in the day as well when you were always at like um I don't know, I, I do tell inappropriate jokes and I do occasionally become a bit of a swearing Mary but like in that environment I was just so suppressed that I was like I just squashed myself like I wouldn't make inappropriate jokes I wouldn't... Why not? I just didn't feel like I could Why not? Um, I don't know, I was scared that like my colleagues would judge me I, I think I just had this little perfect vision of what an intensive care nurse should be mm -hmm. and like professional 24 7 but that's not real yeah. and and so I wasn't being real yeah. so you you'd not been yourself that was it a year that you were there in, in intensive care no I was in neuro intensive care for two and a half years and then I got sisters post in trauma and orthopedic high dependency okay and that was just short of a year it was about nine months that I was there yeah um 
when I was there in the second job, I thought that what was missing was that I needed to be valued more. So I put myself in a management position. So that's like why I moved out of the other area to get a promotion, but it just made it so much worse. Why? Because my problems came with me. <laughs> like I thought that w- that was the problem, but it wasn't, the problem was me. The problem was that I wasn't speaking up for myself um, and I still wasn't being myself. So the people that were talking to me like rubbish still spoke to me like rubbish and I still let them. So nothing actually changed. So it, so you, maybe if you'd been that version of you anywhere, it wouldn't have worked, it wouldn't, it have, wouldn't have worked, no. It doesn't matter where I'd have gone, like it wouldn't have been any different because it was me that needed to do something, not the job, it wasn't the job. And is that the, the point at which you decided to come on the course? Um, No, I came on the course before that. I came on the course when I was thinking that I needed an outlet, so like the creative stuff, and I thought this would be that. And then that was the first time that I came on the course, so like I'd been thinking about it. We went on holiday in the October, and I booked on the course in the November. So that was of 2015. And then I absolutely cracked myself and was like well, right now I don't know what I'm doing and I've tried to set a business up so I didn't do anything for a few months and then I thought, oh, I'll do another course. So I did another course, still the same, because I wasn't advertising really, just telling people what I did. Um, And then not really, I just didn't know what we're doing. (laughs) You mean business-wise? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. just, I didn't really know what I should have been doing at the time, like... Um, I don't think the social media stuff was as like intense as it was like four years ago or I don't, I don't even think I had an Instagram like yeah. I wasn't as savvy yeah. with technology so I just put like one post I do lip filler come see me yeah, yeah, yeah. and then didn't get anybody and was like oh I'm a failure yeah <laughs> and then what changed there like what made you realize that you Leo. had to do different so it's like you, you need to be consistent you can't just put like one post like who's gonna see it and he was like he's really business minded though like that's who he is but I didn't get it at that time I just thought it would be nice <laughs> <laughs> I just thought just stop nagging me like you know like it was just properly it felt like it were really getting at me to like be consistent and post every day and like don't just put on Facebook go leaflet and I was like what do you mean go speak to people that was stupid like that's how it was and then, but you did, you did overcome that, though, didn't you? You did it was start doing just, all those things. He calls it gentle persuasion. <laughs> I call it something totally different. <laughs> but he he would be like, "Come on, we'll go out, fly you in. Do you know we'll post these through, get some flyers made. Do you know I'll help you do it? it, it it's really, it's really helped me actually. Oh, that's wonderful. And so that was in two thousand and. You thought of it in the October 2015, is yeah, that right? Yeah, and then I did the course in 2015, but I didn't really get going until 2016. Okay, okay. After you'd done two courses. Yeah. And was it the lip, was it the foundation and then the lip and cheek? Yeah, it, just and, lips. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. foundation and lips. I didn't do cheeks till last year. And you, when you, at that point, was that the point where you started to get real with yourself and Liam was having a word and saying, come on, you need to be consistent? When did that, no, that kick in? No, that took ages. That's taken, like, what are we now, 2019? I'd say probably the last 18 months. Yeah. To really decide that this is what I want to do. I think I saw it as an outlet and as a hobby. But yeah. then actually when I saw people really doing it full time, I was like, no, this could be a job. But I didn't know how to make it a job. And so it just took a long time for me to accept that that could be a real full-time job. Yeah. But why did you, what was it that made you want to take to transition from hobby? Because, you know, hobbies, obviously most hobbies we pay for, don't we? So there's always, you know, it doesn't really, you can pay for your hobby. It doesn't need to be bringing back money. So what made you go from basically thinking it was a hobby to think, yeah, you saw other people doing it, but what made you actually take action to make it into something more serious? Just misery, pure misery. Like, not really knowing what else I could do and thinking, like, I do want to be a nurse, but I don't know where I fit. And thinking that I didn't want to go through the pain of going to be the newbie at another job again. Um, 
and just thinking about this in the context of a lifestyle choice as well and like what could this do for us later you said it yeah um and just seeing how other people live i suppose that they have got more free time or they don't do shifts they don't do nights like you don't do lip fillers on the night night time <laughs> do you know like all that could be erased so there were quite a few things that this would erase yeah but what made you have the faith that you could make it into something more because you oh, after yeah. all you it was him yeah yeah a million percent i didn't believe it it was him he's like you can do that and you can be happy and make it work and i was like i don't know if i can so it was just him that's gorgeous what would you say to someone who doesn't have a really supportive partner like that who doesn't push them how can they push themselves you just got to strengthen yourself i think i think where i was in, in my old job and being miserable I'd, like we were speaking before i'd totally squashed who i was and i think you have to just find yourself again and build your self-confidence and just you have to empower yourself because no one else will do it for you like it's all right liam telling me to do these things but ultimately if I don't want to do it, I won't do it. Mm-hmm. So you have to have some self-belief, which I, I must have had, otherwise I wouldn't have done it. But, yeah, just little things. It doesn't even have to be that you, like, just go and get a clinic somewhere. It's that, you know, like, you sort out something that you needed to do for ages, you know, like, these little jobs that build up. In your setting, so little things that you know will help move things yeah, forward. Yeah, so, like, the advertising thing, like, that was, you know, the lives used to absolutely terrify me and now I can't, I can't stop staring at myself I'm like, okay. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> like every time I have something to say I'm like oh, I want to tell people and I want to share it whereas before I was like oh god I don't want to do this that fascinates me how <laughs> can someone I mean I've seen it happen loads of times with you guys the people that are in you know in our um, like in our medical aesthetics mindset warrior group and etc but if I'd met you in that moment, when so tell me when was that that you were a bit like, oh, oh lives. What, about 18 months ago? It was, um, it was after a video that you did about cliff jumping. And, and I thought, well, I'm here. Like, we just, it was just it, the bare bones of this, really. It'd been painted. The and, yeah, and I had, like, um, this desk, one of the desks in there and a chair. And I was sat there and I was like... I really don't want to do this. And then I pressed it and I recorded something and then I deleted it. I think I did it about four or five times and then I remember you saying, like, push the damn button, like, you're doing that thing with Tim and I was like, oh, I couldn't do it. So I just I just pressed it and just started talking and I just turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, that was horrible. <laughs> and then I just kept doing that more till it became a daily ritual, I suppose. <laughs> so... This, this is what fascinates me. It's like, how does someone go from... Admittedly, someone is creative and you have had that kind of outlet yeah. in the past, but still in that moment, you really freaking don't want to do it. Like, it's, you delete it, it's four times, and you're like, oh, you know, you probably pay money to, like, get out of this. And then to go from that to actually thinking, oh, I've got an idea, I'd like to get it out into the world, which is exactly how I feel. How does someone go from that to that? It's... I think it's when you see people taking value in something that you've said. Okay. So, um, when I make them before, I'd hope that no one would see them. Yeah. <laughs> and, and be quite glad that when there were like no views, I was like, oh, thank God for that. But actually, one of, someone had sent me a message being like, oh, I didn't know that. And I was like, oh, that means I've shared something that they didn't know. So, it was that. That's so powerful. This, this is what I love because, so you had a brave moment, a little like, like something blossomed from you and then someone was able to come and get value from that and then yeah. they blossom and then they spread it. It's just beautiful the way it spreads. I think the nature of like me being a nurse, like I want to help people. So then knowing someone telling me that I have been helpful yeah. is like, oh, that's good. Tell me about though, because this is, this is a tricky area. Uh-huh. What about if you are doing it and like people will be watching, they will be, you know, doing the lives and they you know, I've told them to, so they do, they're doing it dutifully, perhaps not getting a great deal back. Mm-hmm. Have you had moments where you haven't got stuff back and you've, but you've kept going anyway? Yeah, those times. I mean, like, I had that lady comment about me. It was something to do with cosmetic um, products not 
absorbent into the skin basically over the counter products not being very active they don't have active ingredients um and she had said that that was that of value to her but then i've done some other videos and no one commented and then you just think is anyone watching does anyone care like is there any point so why do you keep going then i like doing it now it's, now yeah right. and so what so is the sequence feel like you don't want to do it be brave and do it anyway yeah after a while get something back yeah think this thing is valuable yeah and then even when you're still doing it and you don't get that you still is it still that you're remembering when someone did get value and it pushes you on and that's what you enjoy well it's uh, it's me learning about being consistent as well so i think when when i've read like other business things or people have said you know you need to keep keep doing things for people to engage and and it's that and i just thought well if i keep going like people will maybe listen yeah it's just fair i suppose it's a bit well i i think it's like eastenders we eastenders we know it's on we know it's on every night or whatever however long it's often and we know it's going to be a certain way it's going to be you know and then there's another one that like coming away that's going to be a bit different so you make your choice but you know when they will be there and i think that's the problem is that people aren't consistent yeah. and so the viewers subconsciously know not to really trust them to be there for them whereas you have been incredibly consistent that that i think as well the intensive care stuff does feed into that in in the i like routine so with with that in mind like that's a bit of a plan for my day that i'll do like a live or a video or so that gives me a bit of structure to my business that I didn't have before. And did you, when you're being consistent, mm -hmm. when you start first started to be consistent with your social media and your marketing, did you get stuff back? Like, did you get anything back from your flyering? I'm intrigued. Um, flyering, no. Oh, apart from when I went to give a lady a flyer, she said, oh, are you that lady from um, that does the videos? Yeah. So she recognised me, so that's really weird. But there I am. <laughs> so and I was really it. embarrassed. I was like, oh. So she did. So I thought, actually, I've gone out flyering, but she's seen something I've done before. Yeah. And I thought that was quite... I found that really powerful, actually, because I was like, no one watches, no one cares. No, they do, actually. They do watch because she recognised me. Yeah. So that was bizarre. And they say with marketing as well that you should do multiple touch points, shouldn't you? So you, people have to see you 16 times to make an inquiry or something like that. Um, so then you were you were touching her more than once. Yeah, and then, so that happened when I went flyering. So that made me feel good about the flyering because I was like, oh, okay, that means that there is, you know, like my brand and stuff is getting around. So it, I am being exposed. And then I went shopping at, there's a new shopping centre close to here and I just went to get a jacket and... I spoke to this lady and I said, oh, I've got this jacket in size 12 or whatever. And she's like, oh, are you that skincare lady? <laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> and I was just really embarrassed. So I was like, and she's like, oh, I watch all your videos. I was like, oh my God. Oh, beautiful. But it was really flattering at the same time. But I was like, oh my God. You know, like when you can't recall everything you've said, you're like, oh, is that, was that cringy? Like, was it helpful? I don't know. I kind of wanted to ask her, but I was too embarrassed. So I was just like, oh, thanks. And then, well, like... I think the fact that she's watching them multiple times <laughs> means that... So you interesting, you used an interesting word earlier, exposed. Now yeah. you use it, but it, like as in recently, just a few minutes ago, and you used it in a positive, because obviously yeah. exposure is like a marketing term, isn't it? Like yeah. the more we become exposed, the more people will see us, the more they're more likely to buy from us. But... Of course, the word exposed is a horrible word as well, that we all feel like socially exposed. How did you feel in, you know, it's a relatively small village, town, Gartha. Did you feel like, oh God, I'm going to put something out there and... I felt utterly stupid. <laughs> like, I thought, what what if one day I make a live and I say something really ridiculous and I lose my MC pin and I just start this catalyst of like, what ifs, do you know, of being really cautious about what I said and then I think that takes away from it being natural. Okay, tell me more. Um, so like, before I were like recording, deleting, recording, deleting, I was like, no, because that's not real. So sometimes now I'll just press and talk and I don't look at it and I don't delete it. I just let whatever come out, come out. But before I was like, 
what, what will they think of me down the street or like the other beauty therapists will they watch and be like oh dear like who does she think she is blah 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 so it stopped me doing some of the lives and stuff that and then I just thought well what if my friends and family see it what will they think in a good way or a bad way bad way oh, right. like who does she think she is recording herself like does she just love the sound of her own voice or I don't know all that I thought about. But how did you overcome that? I just did it anyway. It, it was the... But the, why? Um, why would you keep going when... Because I just didn't want to go back to my old job. I just didn't want to go back there. I was like, what can I do to help myself? And and you do have to go through a bit of pain. So for me, like, it was more painful to go back to my old job than it was painful to do the other stuff. Your intensive care job? Yeah, so like being in an environment when I wasn't happy, I didn't enjoy my shifts, like I wasn't eating very well, I wasn't sleeping very well, I was anxious, I thought I was going to be in an accident all the time because I was exposed to accidents on a daily basis, like it just takes over your mind. And how do you feel now with who you are now and looking around this beautiful environment and knowing that you have felt the fear and done it anyway? and that you're consistent, and that it's working. Mm. How do you feel when you look back on her, the one who was anxious, the one who was scared, not eating properly, feeling worried that she's gonna get in accidents? What, what, how do you feel looking back on her? I feel really sad. It does make me really sad because I just think, I don't know who that was now. Whereas when I was there, that was me. <laughs> like. It's just, it is it is our mindset. Like, you do have to, it's a conscious choice to try and not be there. And it's really hard. But I, I knew that I, I didn't want to just exist there. I don't know how to explain. That so, more. when you say exist, you mean it was just like you were just existing, you were just going through the I'm motions? Just, yeah, just going through the motions, like hand over at iPad 7, you know, get, same people, same conversations, blah, 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 same injuries, do you know, it just became so, I can't even think of it, just repetitive and, but, but not happy repetition, no. it's constant stream of sadness, and I just thought, like, what am I doing for myself, like, what, I, is this making me happy, no, I'm happy when I get home, no, I couldn't even sit through a film, I'd fall asleep, like, we'd try and watch TV, and I'd just like, and how, so you've mentioned Liam a few times, he sounds like a massive love, I've, already, I've thought that already. How, I'm not saying, you know, everything will be shining in the garden, because relationships are always tough, but how are things now in terms of now that you are able to be that freer, Maria, are you able to sit through a film? Oh yeah, like, <laughs> well, now we argue about what we're going to watch, or we'll watch like <laughs> one or two. Like, time-wise, it's, it's completely changed our lives. Like, even though... I'm working hard, like, and, and I'm probably the busiest I've ever been in terms of stuff to do. But because it's my stuff, I'm, I'm happy to do it. And, like, because we've made this together, like, every day I come to work, I'm like, do you know, this is, this is my workplace. Like, we made this. That you crafted. Yeah, like, we physically made it. Like, this flooring, who put that down? Like... I chose the colours on Pinterest, sat for hours on Pinterest, like, what do I want it to look like? And all that I love. And did you tell us about that? Because I, I observed this because you, I don't know whether you meant to do this, but you documented the pro, like that, documenting the process of building this clinic. And that's when I kind of first fall, fell in love with you because I, and there's something interesting in that though as well that I must just say, I fell in love with Maria because she was, like, I was watching her physically go through the kind of I know it was a lovely creative process but it was still painful isn't it like you couldn't oh, get it's the... horrible like I, I, I hate mess <laughs> I hate dust I hate like <laughs> I hate the build <laughs> tell us it's... about the, uh, the lips oh the, the lips, lips are so hell so like the inspiration for the decor was a, a painting uh, by Salvador Dali and um, it's a Mae West tribute and it's a pair of lips that he painted um, and then there's one that's really expensive I think they're like 500 quid or something and I just went on eBay and I saw this and um, it was in the next village along for 50 quid I was like the lip sofa yeah so I was like right I want that sofa 
so they meant that will not fill up the stairs and I was like well we'll make it fit <laughs> um, and so we got to the point when we were ready to put it in and then it wouldn't fit up the stairs so he dismantled it he took it apart he folded it um, and then we took the banisters off in the hallway like I was kicking it up the stairs <laughs> like he Get was pulling it there. Um, and then we got it in and I was like yeah like really excited we went no don't be excited I've not fixed it up yet like it might be so damaged that actually we <laughs> you can't get anyone to sit on it because it'll be dangerous and I was like you better make it fit <laughs> make it work <laughs> fix it for me and he did <laughs> so the so that seeing your like struggles and your you know but I knew the energy was you were gonna you know you were gonna create this come hell, hell high in water I even remember, I think when you actually got, when you actually started renting this, this oh, yeah. I think you were, and, but for me as a consumer of your content, of your marketing content, it was awesome for me to see you going through that process. So the reason I bring that up is because I think people watching and listening to this should absolutely, if you're going through a build or, you know, a, a redecoration of your clinic or whatever, or anything really, you know, document the process. It's a Gary yeah. Vee concept, but yeah. I feel like reflectively as well, I like looking back when, you know, like you still have crap days even when you've made something nice for yourself. Um, when I think about how miserable I feel on a day, I'm like, well, is it as bad as this? And I'll like look at pictures and I'm like, yes, it's really not. Let's put it into perspective. Like this is, this is good. But also this is good, but also you get to, you get to build this. Oh yeah. So if you have like more, so if you're having a rubbish day, I think what you, I heard you say earlier is it's on you. Like you oh, yeah. now that you've now that you've your mindset through learning. Oh yeah, I do a thing and then it impacts the world. Oh, I'll do some more of that stuff. You kind of you've learned that, haven't you? And yeah. so now you just do more stuff, and it's still painful. It's still like you're pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, but you do. I think it's more rewarding. I think the reward is greater now, and that's why I keep changing things. Or like like that's new, like the flower wall and stuff. And like I see other people's like decorations and stuff like that, and I think, oh, like yeah, I'll do that in the shop. It'll look nice, and yeah. So you you're building more and more. Yeah, I, I enjoy adding to it. And tell us a bit about the business. Do you how many days a week do you work in Sussex? So I do four days a week now mm-hmm. here, and then Mondays and Fridays in a GP surgery. Okay. So you do it six days a week? Yeah. Okay. And then when do you do your admin at things? Uh, in between patients, yeah. sometimes at home, just a bit all the time, really. I think it's one of those things that it's just like a constant stream of... Ordering yeah. and notes and stuff. Yeah. But what I think what, what, where I was going with that is you don't, you don't spend your day off on that, do you? Oh, no. Okay. No, like if I have Sunday off, I'm literally like in my pyjamas, you know, like cutting grass, doing yeah. stuff at home, like... Sort of the chickens out. So chickens out. <laughs> <laughs> nice stuff. Yeah. Like, I, I didn't before. Like, that's my new thing. From, I'd say, me getting the practice nurse job, I was like, no, my day off is my day off. I'm doing nothing related to work. And it works now. Mm-hmm. It does work. So I will sit there and just watch a bit of rubbish TV. I, I like watching Saturday Kitchen and catching mm-hmm. up on the... Sunday brunch and stuff like that. Sunday kitchen's such torture though because you can never, you haven't never got the food in that they're cooking. Oh, I know. You can't just, recreate just get massive it. Massive food envy, and then <laughs> yeah. because I've been dieting, I'm like, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. <laughs> but you, your time off now. Am I right in saying it is fulfilling you? Oh yeah, yeah, hugely. Like, I mean, we've just moved house, so <laughs> that that's renovating at home in the free time. But again, it's something else that we're making so it feels exciting it's not stressful whereas I think before if I'd have done this while I went into this I'd have done an absolute nervous breakdown yeah. like I wouldn't have been able to move house as well yeah as having two jobs so are you pleased that you did aesthetic massively it's the best thing I ever did for myself and like if anyone's thinking about it I'd say even if later on you don't want to do it just do the course try and do you know see if it is for you and if it's not then that's fine I think the other thing that this has brought me is an acceptance of letting things go Mm -hmm. so like with my old job I I don't regret leaving now I'm not ashamed that I left as a sister and I'm just me here like no ranking you know no 
hierarchy, there's none of that, and I didn't actually want it. I thought I did, but I didn't. Mm-hmm. So I just said, just do it anyway. And would you, obviously, you've done your training with Skin Baby Training. Do you, has that been part of your journey, do you think? I think so. I think the ethos of your business, like, I really loved because you've got really like strong values and strong ethics. And they don't deviate, they are consistent. And I think when you see other people that all have similar values and it, it just attracted me straight away. And that's why I've not actually done any other dermal filler training with anyone else. <laughs> because I just like, it's the after as well. So it's not just training, it's the mindset group, the clinical advice, the networking, like I've met loads of nice people. It's all of it. So it wasn't just the course, it was the aftercare I think I needed <laughs> for myself. Why? I'm just not trusting my own judgement, I suppose. Just been a bit scared of the stuff I was doing and thinking, is that right? Do you know, like, can I do it better? Is there, do you know, what else can I know? Yeah. And that turned into my thing where I'd just read people's complications. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On the Skimmy of Training group and kind of, yeah, to get yourself genned up. Well, yeah, I think it does increase your knowledge. Like, why, why is someone having this antibiotic and that and what guideline are they using and stuff and gives you a point of reference yeah because you're curious and you want to well be I'm alone best. now there's that but I think there was something very vulnerable about working alone that scared me and that everything's on me and actually if I mess something up you know it's not a it's not the fault of the environment it is mine mm. so that that was scary so in the groups you felt like less uh, you're in more of a team it's not yeah a bit more team somewhere to go i think whereas like you used to in the hospital someone else being more senior than you and you asking them a question just bouncing ideas of each other um you don't really have that when you're working alone but i feel like on the group there's always someone that is reading or yeah. will reply so within like a, at least now you'd look, probably get at least one reply yeah and what was your favourite course out of it? Because you've done quite a few, haven't you? Cheeks. Really? Mm. You love a bit of cheek the action. Cheeks, yeah. I mean, I was a bit sad on the day because all my patients were young and I was like, oh, is it going to do anything? But then after, I was like, bloody hell, this changes people's faces. This is amazing. Yeah. So it just changed my assessment completely. Tell me more. Um, well, it's not just filling lines. I suppose I understood more about the structures that are underneath the skin and then why cheek filler would then ha- enhance another area. So like your nasal liberal folds or like your jaw um, like tear troughs mm-hmm. like all of it so it totally changed how I looked at the face so it's like a linchpin almost like in the well, centre well yeah it's scaffold yeah. isn't it yeah. like you're literally just foundations and then everything around it yeah oh, it's nice to hear you say that about the cheeks because I think sometimes people find cheeks a bit frustrating because they do take up quite a lot don't they and um, quite a lot of product um, and yeah so it's nice to hear you say that I, think, I, think I agree it, with you I think like with that, it's about seeing like the end goal. So like if do you know like you've got a really good patient that said, "I'm an open book type thing," and you say, "Well, cheeks and that." If this was the concern, then you'd be like, "I know it's going to make a difference." Yeah, it's quite exciting. And so you kind of so it's almost like they've opened themselves up to you probably because you've got a, you've done a good consultation by the way, and you've got a good bond and rapport. And then you said, ooh, I can use my extra clinical skills here and yeah. start building a scaffolding instead of just, yeah, dealing with the, like, the polyfiller, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's not just chasing lines anymore. It's like you're supporting the structures underneath. So I find it fascinating. And I found since I had um, a lot of work that my... So let's say that if you take the polyfill analogy right towards the end and you just talk about foundation, I feel like my foundation goes on better because I've got some really good scaffolding. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so yeah, it's lovely that you've experienced that. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely love it. That's, that's definitely been my favourite course. Cheeks, yeah. Yeah. Okay, fab. So, in conclusion, if, you, if someone was watching this now and they are thinking of getting into aesthetics, you said to them, you know, just do it. Mm-hmm what would be what would you what would be the one piece of maria advice from your from what the sort of the the, the, the ebbs and flows the roller coaster that you've experienced what would the how could you pay it forward with what what do you wish you'd known back in 2015 i'd have said don't let the opinions of other people put you off 
because they'll think something anyway. So good, bad, whatever they want to think, they will think, but it has absolutely no relevance on what you're doing. And that's what I'd say. Ignore them and do it anyway. Amazing. Oh, I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud you've crafted a life for yourself. Not many people can say that from scratch. Mm. It was a great pleasure. Thank you for letting me delve into your aesthetics world. And I hope you guys have enjoyed that. Please let us know if there's any other topics or people that you would like us to explore and tackle in the podcast. And please drop us a review on iTunes. It really means a lot to us to know that you value the podcast. And if you're watching us on social media, drop us a comment below to let us know about how you found this and anything else you'd like us to explore. Bye.